Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari Part 1. The Cognitive Revolution 1. An Animal of No Significance About 14 billion years ago, matter, energy, time, and space came into being in what is known as the Big Bang. The story of these fundamental features of our universe is called physics. About 300,000 years after their appearance, matter and energy started to started to coalesce into complex structures called atoms, which then combined, in, combined into molecules. The story of atoms, molecules, and their interactions is called chemistry. About 4 billion years ago, on a planet called Earth, Certain molecules combine to form particularly large and intri intricate structures called organisms. The story of organisms is called biology. About 70,000 years ago, organisms belonging to the species Homo sapiens started to form even more elaborate structures called cultures. The subsequent development of these human cultures is called history. Three important revolutions shaped it. The course of history. The cognitive revolution kick started history ab about 70,000 years ago. The agriculture revolution sped it up about 12,000 years ago. The scientific revolution, which got under the way only 500 years ago, may well end history and start something completely different. This book tells the story of how these three revolutions have affected humans and their fellow organisms. There were humans long before there was history. Animals, such like modern humans, first appeared about 2.5 million years ago. But for countless generations, they did not stand out from the myriad, myriad from other organisms that populated the planet. On a hike in East Africa 2 million years ago, you might well have encountered a familiar cast of human characters, anxious mothers cuddling their babies for clutches of carefree children playing in the mud, temperamental youths chaffing against the decades of society and weary elders who just want to be left in peace, chest-thumping macos trying to impress the local beauty of and wise old matriarchs who had already seen it all. These are ch Archaic humans loved, played, formed close friendships, and competed for status and power. But so did chimpanzees, baboons, and elephants. There was nothing special about humans. Nobody, nobody, least of all humans themselves, had any inkling that their descendants would one day walk on the moon, split the atom, photomic and genetic code, and write history books. The most important thing is to know about prehistoric humans is that they were insignificant animals with no more impact on their environment than gorillas, fireflies, or jellyfish. Biologists classify organisms into species. Animal animals are said to belong to the same species if they tend to mate with each other, giving birth to fertile offspring. Horses and donkeys have a recent common ancestor and share many physical traits, but they show little sexual interest in one, each, one another. They will mate if included to do so, but their offspring, called mules, are sterile. Mutations in donkey DNA can therefore never cross over to horses, or vice versa. The two types of animals are consequently considered two distinct species, moving along separate evolutionary paths. By contrast, a bulldog and a spinal may lo look very different, but they are members of the same species, sharing the same DNA pool. They will happily mate, and their puppies will grow up to pair off with other dogs and produce more puppies. Species that evolved from a common ancestor are bunched together under the he heading genus. Lions, tigers, leopards, and jaguars are different species within the genus Panthera. 
Biologists label organisms with a two-part Latin name, genus, genus followed by the genus by species. Lions, for example, are called Pathena, Pathera leo, the species of leo of the genus Pathera. Presumably, everyone reading this book is a Homo sapiens, the species sapiens of the genus Homo. Genera in their turn are grouped into fam families such as the cats, the dogs, and the elephants. Elephants. All members of a family trace their lineage back to founding matriarch or patriarch. All cats, for example, from the smallest house kitten to the most fury, ferocious lion, share a common f feline ancestor who lived about 25 million years ago. Homo sapiens, too, belongs to a family. The spinal fact used to be one of history's most closely guarded secrets. Homo sapiens long preferred to view itself as set, set apart from animals. An orphan who has no family, no cousins, and most importantly, no parents. But that's just not the case. Like it or not, we are the members of a large and particularly noisy family called the Great Apes. Our nearest living relatives include, include chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. The chimpanzees are the closest. Just six million years ago, a single female ape had two daughters. One became the ancestor of all chimpanzees, the other is our own grandmother. Skeletons in the Closet Homo sapiens had kept hidden an even more disturbing secret. Not only do we possess the abundance of uncivilized cousins, once upon a time we had quite a few brothers and sisters as well. We are used to thinking about ourselves as the only humans, because for the last 10,000 years, our species had indeed been the only human species around. If the real meaning of a word human is an animal belonging to the genus Homo, and there used to be many other species of this genus besides Homo sapiens. Moreover, more, moreover as we shall see in the last chapter of the book, in the no so, not so distant future, we might again have to contend with non sapiens humans. To clarify this point, I will often use the term sapiens to de denote members of the species Homo sapiens, while reserving the term human to refer all to all the members of the genus Homo. Humans first evolved in East Africa about 2.5 million years ago, from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus, which means the southern ape. About 2 million years ago, some of these archaic men and women left their homeland to journey through and set settle vast areas of North Africa, Europe, and Asia. Since survival in the snowy forests of Northern Europe required different traits than those needed to stay alive in Indonesia's steaming jungles, human populations evolved in different directions. The result was several distinct species, to each of which scientists have assigned pom pompous Latin name. Human in Europe and Western Asia evolved into Homo, nen Homo nenthalensis, man from the Nether Valley, popularly referred to simply as, as Nenderthals. And their souls, bulkier and more muscular than us sapiens, were well adapted to the cold climate of the Ice Age, Western Eurasia. The more eastern regions of Asia were populated to Homo erectus, upright man, who survived there for close to 2 million years, making it the most durable human species ever. This record is unlikely to be broken even by our own species. It is doubtful whether Homo sapiens will still be around a thousand years from now, so two million years is really out of our league. On the island of Java in Indonesia lived Homo sol solonensis, man from the Solo Valley, 
who was suited to life in the tropics. On another Indonesian island, the small island of Flores, archaic humans underwent a process of dwarfing. Humans first reached Flores when the sea level was exceptionally low, and the island was easily accessible from the mainland. When the seas rose again, some people were trapped on the island, which was poor in res- resources. Big people who need a lot of food died first. Smaller fellows survived much better. Over the generations, the people of Flores became dwarves. This unique species, known as by scientists as Homo florensis, reached a maximum height of only one meter and weighed no more than twenty-five kilograms. They were nevertheless, nevertheless, able to produce stone tools and even managed occasionally to hunt down some of the island's elephants. Though to be fair, the elephants were dwarf species as well. In twenty ten, another lost sibling was rescued from obil- ob- oblivion. When scientists excavate- excavating the Denisova cave in si- Siberia discovered a fossil fossiling- fossilized finger bone. Genetic an- analysis proved that the finger belonged to a previously unknown human species, which was named Homo Denisova. Who knows how many lost relatives of ours are waiting to be discovered in other caves, on other islands, and in uh, other climes. While these humans were evolving in Europe and Asia, evolution in East Africa did not stop. The cradle, cradle of humanity continued to nurture numerous new species, such as Homo rudolphinus, rudolphinsis, man from Lake Rudolph, Homo Ergaster, working man, and eventually our own species, which we've immodestly named Homo sapiens, wise man. The members of some of these species were massive, and others were dwarfs. Some were fearsome hunters, and others meek plant gatherers. Some lived only on a single island, which many roamed over continents. But all of them belonged to the genus Homo. They were all human beings. It's commonly fallacy to envision these species as arranged in a straight line of des- descent, with Ergaster be- begetting Erectus, Erectus begetting the Nenthrthins, and then Nenthrthins evolving into us. This linear model gives the mistaken impression that at any particular moment of only one type of human inhabited the Earth. And that all earlier species were merely older models, older, older models of ourselves. The truth is that from about two million years ago, around ten thousand years ago, the world was home, and one at one and the same time to several human species. And why not? Today there are many species of bears: brown bears, black bears, grizzly bears, polar bears. The Earth was once walked by at least six species of men. It's our current exclusivity that, not that multi-species past, that is peculiar, and perhaps incriminating, as we will shortly see. We Sapiens have good reasons to repress the memories of our siblings. The cost of thinking. Despite their many differences, all human species share several defining characteristics. Most notably. Humans have extraordinarily large brains compared to other animals. Mammals weighing sixty kilograms have an average brain of two hundred cubic centimeters. The earliest men and women, two two point five million years ago, had brains of about six hundred cubic centimeters. Modern sapiens so- sport a brain averaging thousand two hundred to thousand four hundred cubic centimeters. Nenthrthen. Though brains were even bigger, that evolution should select for larger brains may seem to us like well a no-brainer. We are so en- enamored for our high intelligence that we assume that when it comes to our cerebral power, more must be better. But if that was the case, the feline family would also have produced cats who would do calculus by f- and frogs would. By now, have launched their own space program. 
water giant brains so rare in the animal kingdom. The fact is that jumbo brain is a jumbo drain, drain on the body. It's not easy to carry around, especially when encased in a massive skull. It's even harder to fuel. In Homo sapiens, the brain accounts for about two, two to three percent of total body weight, but it consumes twenty five percent of the body's energy when the body is at rest. By comparison, the brains of other apes require only eight percent of rest time energy. Archaic humans paid for their large brains in two ways. Firstly, they spent more time in search of food. Secondly, their muscles atrophied, like the government diverting money from deficit to education. Humans diverted energy to biceps to neurons. It's hardly a foregone conclusion that this is a good strategy for survival on just savanna. A chimpanzee can't win an argument with Homo sapiens, but the ape can rip the man apart like a ragdoll. Today, our big brains pay off nicely because we can produce cars and guns that enable us to move much faster than chimps and shoot them from a safe distance instead of wrestling. But cars and guns are a recent phenomenon. For more than two million years, human neural networks kept growing and growing. But apart from some flint knives and pointed sticks, humans had precious little to show for it. What then drove forward to evolution of a massively, massive human brain during those two million years? Frankly, we don't know. Another singular human trait is that we walk up straight on two legs. Standing up, it's easier to scan the savanna for games or enemies. And arms that are unnecessary for locomotion are freed for for other purposes, like throwing stones or signaling. The more things these hands could do, the more successful their owners were. So evolutionary pressure brought about an increasing concentration of nerves and finely tuned muscles in the palms and fingers. As a result, humans can perform very Intricate tasks with their hands. In particular, they can produce and use sophisticated tools. The first evidence of tool production dates from about 2.5 million years ago, and the manufacture of use of tools are the criteria by which archaeologists recognize ancient humans. Yet, walking up straight has its downside. The skeleton of our primate ancestor developed for millions of years to su- support a creature that walked on all fours and had relatively small head. Adjusting to an upstraight position was quite a challenge, especially when the scarfo- sc- scaffolding had to support an extra large cranium. Humankind paid for its lofty vision and industrious hands with backaches and stiff necks. Women paid extra. An upright gait required narrower hips, con- constricting the birth canal. And this just when babies' heads were getting bigger and bigger. Death and childbirth became a major hazard for human females. A woman who gave birth earlier, when the infant's brain and head were still relatively small and supple, fa- fared better and lived to have more children. Natural selection consequently favored earlier births, and indeed compared to other animals, humans are born prematurely when many of their vital systems are still undev- underdeveloped. A colt can trot shortly after birth. A kitten leaves its mother to for- forage on its own when it is just a few weeks old. Human babies are helpless dependent for many years on their elders for sustenance protection and education. This fact has contributed contributed greatly both to humankind's extraordinarily social abilities and to its unique social problems. Low mothers could hardly forage enough food for their offspring and themselves with needy children in tow. Raising children required constant help from other family fam- other family members and neighbors. 
It takes a tribe to raise a human. Evolution thus favored those capable of forming strong social ties. In addition, since humans are born underdeveloped, they can be educated and socialized to a far greater extent, extent from than any other animal. Most mammals emerge from a womb like glazed earth, earthenware emerging from a clin, kiln. Any attempt of remolding will only scratch or break them. Humans emerge from a womb like molten glass from a furnace. They can be spun, stretched, and shaped with a surprising degree of freedom. This is why today we can educate our children to become Christian or Buddhist, capitalist or socialist, warlike or peace-loving. We seem that a large brain, the use of tools, superior learning abilities, and complex social structures are huge, huge advantages. It seems self-evident that these have made humankind the most powerful animal on Earth. But humans enjoyed all of these advantages for for a full two million years, during which they remained weak and marginal creatures. Thus, humans who lived a million years ago, despite their big brains and sharp stone tools, dwelt in constant fear of predators, rarely hunted large game, and subsisted many mainly by gathering plants. scooping up insects, stalking small animals, and eating the carrion left behind by other more powerful carnivores. One of the most common uses of early stone tools was to crack open bones in order to get to the marrow. Some researchers believe this was our original Nietzsche, just as woodpeckers specialize in extracting insects from the trunks of trees. The first humans specialized in extracting marrow from bones. Why marrow? Well, suppose you observe a pride of lions take down down and devour a giraffe. You wait patiently until they're done. But it's not not your turn because first the hyenas and jackals. And you don't dare to interfere with them. Scavenge the leftovers. Only then would you... And your band dare, band dare approach the carcass, look cautiously left and right, and dig into the edible tissue that remained. This is a key to understanding our history and psychology. Genus Homo's position in the food chain was, until quite recently, solidly in the middle. For millions of years, humans hunted small creatures and gathered what they could all the while being hunted by larger predators. It was only 400,000 years ago that several species of men began to hunt large games on reg- a regular basis. And only in the last 100,000 100, years, with the rise of Homo sapiens, that men jumped to the top of the food chain. The spectacular leap on the middle of to the top had enormous consequences. Other animals at the top of the pyramid, such as lions and sharks, evolved that that position very gradually over millions of years. This enabled the ecosystem to develop checks and balances that prevent lions and sharks from wrecking too much havoc. As lions became deadlier, so gazelles evolved to run faster, hyenas to cooperate better, and rhinos to to be more bad-tempered. In contrast, humankind ascended to the top so quickly that the ecosystem was not given time to adjust. Moreover, humans themselves fail, failed to adjust. Most top predators of the planet are majestic creatures. Millions of years, the do- dominion have filled them with self-confidence. Sapiens, by contrast, contrast, is more like a banana republic dictator having so recently been one of the underdogs of the savanna we are full of fears and anxieties of our position which makes us doubly cruel and dangerous many historical calamities from deadly wars to ecological catastrophes have resulted from resulted from this over hasty jump a race of cooks a significant step on the way to the top was the domestication of fire. 
Some human species may have made occasional use of fire early as 800,000 years ago. But about 300,000 years ago, Homo erectus, Nenthrothros, and forefathers of Homo sapiens were using fire on a daily basis. Human now had a dependable source of light and warmth, and a deadly weapon against prowling lions. Not long afterwards, human may even have started deliberately to torch their neighborhoods. A carefully managed fire could turn impassable barren thickets into prime grasslands teeming with game. In addition, once the fire died out, Stone Age entrepreneurs could walk through the smoking remains and harvest charcoal animals, nuts, and tubers. But the best thing fire did was cook. F- foods that humans cannot digest in their natural forms, such as wheat, rice, and potatoes, became sam- staples of our diet thanks to cooking. Fire not only changed food's chemistry, it changed its biology as well. Cooking killed germs and parasites that infested food. Humans also had far easier time chewing and digesting old favorites such as fruits, nuts, insects, and carry on if they were cooked. Whereas chimpanzees spend five hours a day chewing raw food, a single hour suffices, suffices for people eating cooked food. The advent of cooking enabled humans to eat more kinds of food, to devote less time to eating, and to make do with smaller teeth and shorter intestines. Some scholars believe that there is a direct link between the advent of cooking and the shortening of the human intestinal tract and the growth of the human brain. Since long intestines and large brains are both massive energy consumers, it's hard to have both. By shortening the intestines and decreasing their energy consumption, cooking inadvertently opened the way to the the jumbo brains of Neanderthals and Sapiens. Fire also opened the first significant gulf between man and the other animals. The power of Almost all species depend on their bodies. The strength of their muscles, the size of their teeth, the breadth of their wings. Though they may harness winds and currents, they are unable to control these natural forces and are always constrained by their physical design. Eagles, for example, identify thermal columns arising from the ground, spread their giant wings, and allow the hot air to lift them upwards. Yet eagles cannot control the location of the columns, and their maximum carrying capacity is strictly proportional to their wingspan. When humans domesticated fire, they gained control of an obedient and potentially limitless force. Unlike eagles, humans could choose when and where to ignite a flame, and they were able to exploit fire for any number of tasks. Most importantly, the fire, the power of fire was not limited by the form, structure, or strength of the human body. A single woman with a flint or fire stick could burn down an entire forest in a matter of hours. A domestication of fire was a sign of things to come. Our brother's keepers. Despite the benefits of fire, 150,000 years ago, humans were still marginal creatures. They could now scare away lions, warm themselves during cold nights, and burn down the occasional forest. Yet counting all species together, there were still no more than perhaps a million humans living between the Indonesian archipelago and the Iberian Peninsula, a mere blip on the occasional radar. Our own species, Homo sapiens, was already present present on the world stage. But now, far it was minding its own business in the corner of Africa. We don't exactly know where and when animals that can be classified as Homo sapiens first evolved from earlier type of humans. But most scientists agree that 
by 150,000 years ago, East Africa was populated by sapiens that looked just like us. If one of them turned up in the modern morgue, the local pathologist Pathologists would notice nothing peculiar. Thanks to the blessings of fire, they had smaller teeth and jaws than their ancestors, whereas they had massive brains equal in size of ours. Scientists also agree that about 70,000 years ago, Safians from East Africa spread into the Arabian Peninsula, where, and from there they quickly overran the entire Eurasian landmass. When Homo sapiens landed on Arabia, most of the Eurasia was already settled by other humans. What happened to them? There are two conflicting th theories. The interbreeding theory tells the story of attraction, sex and mingling as African immigrants spread around the world. They bred with other human populations, and people today are outcome of these interbreeding. For example, when Safians reached the Middle East of Europe, they encountered their Neanderthals. These humans were more muscular than Safians, had larger brains, and were better adapted to colder climes. They used tools and fires, were good hunters, and apparently took care of their, their sick and infirm. Archaeologists have discovered the bones of Neanderthals who lived for many years with several physical handicaps, evidence that they were cared for by their relatives. Neanderthals were, are often depicted by caricatures and the archetypical, brutish, and stupid cave people, but recent evidence had changed their image. According to the interbreeding theory, when Safians spread it to Neanderthal lands, Safians spread with Neanderthals until the two populations merged. If this is the case, then today's Eurasians are not pure Safians. They are a mixture of Safians and ne Neanderthals. Similarly, when Safians reached East Asia, they interbred with the local Erectus. So the Chinese and Koreans are a mixture of Safians and Erectus. The opposing view, called the replacement theory, tells a very story, one of incompatibility, incompatibility, revulsion, and perhaps had perhaps even genocide. Genocide, according to the theory, Safians and other humans had different anatomies and most likely different mating habits, and even body odors. They would have had little sexual interest in one another, and even if a Neanderthal Romeo and a Safian Juliet fell in love, they could not produce fertile children, because the genetic gulf separating the two populations were already unbridgeable. The two populations remained completely distinct, and when the Neanderthals died out or were killed off, their genes died with them. According to this view, Safians replaced all of the previous human populations without merging with them. If that is the case, the li lineages of contemporary humans can be traced back exclusively to East Asia 70,000 years ago. We are all pure Safians. A lot of hinges on this debate. From an evolutionary perspective, 70,000 years is a relatively short interval. If the replacement theory is correct, all living humans have roughly the same genetic baggage, and ra racial distinctions among them are negligible. But if the interbreeding theory is right, there might well be genetic differences between Africans, Europeans, and Asians that go back hundreds of thousands of years ago. This is a political dynamite, which could provide material for explosive ra racial theories. In recent decades of the replacement theory has been the common wisdom of the field. It has firmer archaeological backing and was more politically correct. Scientists had no, no desire to open up the Pandora's box of racism by claiming significant genetic diversity among modern human populations. 
but that ended in 2010, when the results of a four-year effort to map the Neanderthal genome were published. Genetics, geneticists were able to collect enough to attract intact Neanderthal DNA from fossils to make a broad comparison between it and the DNA of contemporary humans. The results stunned the scientific community. It turned out that 1-4% to of the unique human DNA of modern populations in the Middle East and Europe is Neanderthal DNA. That's not a huge amount, but it's significant. A second shock came several months later. When DNA extracted from the fossilized finger from Denisova was mapped, the results proved that up to 6% of the uni unique human DNA of modern Melanesians and Aboriginal Australians in Denisovan DNA. If these results were are valid, it's important to keep them in mind that further research is underway and may either reinforce or modify the con these conclusions. The interbreeders got at least some things right, but that doesn't mean that the replacement theory is completely wrong, since Neanderthals and Denisovans contributed only a small amount of DNA to our present-day genome. It is impossible to speak of a merger between Safians and other human species, although differences between them were not large enough to completely prevent fertile inter intercourse. They were sufficient to make such contrasts very rare. How then should we understand the biological relateness of Safians, Neanderthals, and Denisovans? Clearly, they were not completely different species like horses and donkeys. On the other hand, they were not just different populations of other of the same species, like bulldogs, bulldogs and saffaniels. Biological reality is not black or white. There are also important gray areas. Every two species that evolved from a common ancestor, such as horses and donkeys, were at one time just two populations of the same species like bulldogs and sapanials. That must have been the point when the two populations were already quite different from one another, but still capable on rare occasions of having sex and producing fertile offspring. Then, another mutation sphere this last connecting thread, and they went their separate evolutionary ways. It seems that about 50,000 years ago, Safians, Neanderthals, and Denisovans were at their borderline point. They were almost, but not quite, entirely separate species. As we shall see in the next chapter, Safians were already di very different from Neanderthals and Denisovians, not only in their genetic code and physical traits, but also in their cognitive and social abilities. Yet it appears it is still just possible, on rare occasions, for Safians and Neanderthal to produce fertile offspring. So the populations did not merge, but a few lucky Neanderthal genes did hitch a ride on the Safians Express. It is unsettling, and perhaps thrilling, to think that we, we Safians could at one time have sex with an animal from a different species and produce ch children together. But if the Neanderthals, Denisovians, and other human species did, didn't merge with Safians, why did they vanish? One possibility is that Homo sapiens drove them to extinction. Imagine a Safians band reaching a Balkan Valley where Neanderthals have lived for hundreds of thousands of years. The newcomers began to hunt the deer and gathered the nuts and berries that were the Neanderthals' traditional staples. Safians were most proficient hunters and gatherers, thanks to, thanks to better technology and superior social skills. So they multiplied and spread. The less resourceful Neanderthals found it increasingly difficult to feed themselves. Their population dwindled and they slowly died out, except perhaps for one or two members who joined their Safians neighbors. Another possibility is that com com 
for resources flared up into violence and, and genocide. Tolerance is not a Safian trademark. In modern times, a sem- small difference in skin color, dialect, or region had been enough to prompt one group of Safians to set about exterminating other group. Would ancient Safians have been more tolerant towards an entirely different human species? It may well be that when he- Safians encountered the Inderthos, the result was the first and only and most significant ethnic cleansing campaign in history. Whichever way it happened, the Neanderthals and the other human species pose one of history's great, great what-ifs. Imagine how things have might have turned out had the Neanderthals or Denisovians survived alongside Homo sapiens. What kind of cultures, societies, and political structures would have emerged in a world where several several different human species coexisted? How, for example, would religious faiths have unfolded? Would the Book of Gen- Gen- Genesis have declared that the Anderthals descended from Adam and Eve? Would Jesus have died for the sins of Denisovans, or would the corn have reserved seats in heaven for all righteous humans, humans, whatever their species? Would Neanderthals have been able to serve in the Roman legions or in the sprawling bro- bureaucracy of imperial China? Would the American Declaration of Independence hold as a self-evident truth that all members of genus Homo are created equal? Or would Karl Marx have urged workers of all species to unite? Over the past 10,000 years, Homo sapiens had grown so accustomed to any other possibility. Our lack of brothers and sisters makes it easier to imagine that we are the epitome of creation, and that a chasm separates us from the rest of the animal kingdom. When Charles Darwin indicated that Homo sapiens was just another kind of animal, people were outraged. Even today, many refuse to believe it. Had the Neanderthals survived, would we still imagine ourselves to be a creature part? Perhaps this is exactly why our ancestor wiped out the Neanderthals. They were too familiar to ignore, but too different to tolerate. Whether Thafians are to blame or not, no sooner they had uh, had they arrived at a new location than the native population became extinct. The last remains of Homo solanensis are dated about 50,000 years ago. Homo Denisova disappeared shortly thereafter. Neanderthals made their exit roughly 30,000 30, years ago. The last dwarf-like humans vanished from Flores Island about 12,000 years ago. They left behind some bones, stone tools, a few genes of our DNA, and had a lot of unanswered questions. They also left behind us, Homo sapiens, the last human species. What was the sapiens' secret of success? How did we manage to settle so rapidly in so many distant and ecologically different habitats? How did we push all other human species into oblivion? Why couldn't even the strong, brainly, cold-proof Neanderthals survive our onslaught? The debate continues to rage. The most likely answer is the very thing that makes the debate possible. Homo sapiens conquered the world thanks above all to its unique language.